In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Christ is in our midst. He is Today we come to the familiar story of the four men who uh, took their paralytic friend and by faith climbed up onto the roof of the house to lower him down in front of Christ, to bring him to Christ's presence so that he could be healed. And at the end of the gospel, it's made very clear that this man's ailment, his paralysis, that he is paralyzed because of his sins. And there are three other different stories of paralytics being healed. Uh, one where he sat by the water for 38 years and then a few others where these concepts of sin, the healing of sin, the forgiveness of sin, and the healing of the body are tied together. And we know that in the other stories because he says, go and sin no more lest the worst thing come upon you. He says that more than once in, in various Gospels. And so we're left with this, this teaching, this, this something that's hard to preach on in any sort of simple way, that sin and our physical ailments are often tied together. And of course, the scribes and Pharisees are upset about this, uh, that Jesus says he forgives his sins. And, and uh, if we were to look at this and to go back into the Old Testament, there's only uh, one, uh, one, only God can forgive sins. And actually, as we head into the New Testament, we would say the same thing, you know, when people come to confess their sins in front of me, the, the priest here, I do not ask them to confess their sins to me. They are confessing to God with me in their presence, with me as a witness. And the prayer I say at the end is a prayer of absolution, although there are different prayers of absolution, that doesn't speak of some power or authority that I have as a person, but it speaks of God forgiving the person with me there as a witness to their repentance. And so the universal teaching, whether in the Old Testament or the New Testament, is that only God can forgive sins. So when Jesus says, your sins are forgiving you, he is doing something very provocative. And the scribes and the Pharisees, they don't think that he's saying, I am God. They're not sitting there saying, oh, he thinks he's God. They think he, they, that he has taken a prerogative of God and has acted as though he had that prerogative. There's never any point in the Gospels where we hear the scribes or Pharisees debating about whether Jesus is God. They always take him as a mere man, and as a matter of fact, even worse than that, because they have to acknowledge at one point either this power comes from God, and if it comes from God, they should follow him because he's a great prophet in these healings, but at other times, they say that obviously, because they cannot deny the miracle, that this power may come from the devil himself, that it may come from Beelzebub. They never think that Jesus is God. So this is a very uh, provocative act, and of course, historically and theologically, we speak about it in retrospect, saying, yes, this is evidence that Christ is God, that he is one with the Father, and so we have no problem with him proclaiming this forgiveness. But ultimately, this forgive today's gospel leads us down the road to his eventual crucifixion. Because this is just one day, one instance, one miracle. And let's not forget that very few miracles are recorded in the New Testament. Our Lord did many more things, so many things that if it was all written down, there wouldn't be enough books to contain it all. This one miracle, it shows that he has, at least to the scribes and Pharisees, committed blasphemy. He has taken the prerogative of God and he has applied it. Now the thing they have to deal with, though, is that he says this and then he says, stand up and walk. Which is easier to say, forgive, forgive your sins? Well, it's easy to, for me to say, your sins are forgiven. Because how does it feel to have your, forgiven, your sins forgiven for most people? It's often very unnoticeable. It's very subtle. If, if you're even sensitive. 
Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or rise up and walk? Rise up and walk, that you may know that the Son of Man has the ability to forgive sins. There's the super controversy, because this man stands up, his sins have been forgiven, and they know that Jesus now has the authority to forgive sins because of the miracle. And of course, this is the scandal of who Jesus Christ is and what eventually leads to his crucifixion. Now, for our purposes, the gospel, the gospel besides speaking of, of Jesus Christ as, as God, our Lord and Savior, the one who forgives sins with the Father and the Holy Spirit, there are different lessons we can take from it. One is that as these men climb, these four men take the effort to bring their friend into the presence of Christ, and that friend is a sinner, as we find out at the end, it's what's caused his paralysis, that we should take the lesson that at times that we need us spiritual ones, us faithful ones need to reach down to those who are sinful, to those who are broken and paralyzed and stuck, and we need to be willing to carry them, either physically or by our prayers, into the presence of Christ, so that they can be healed. That as a community, there are individuals, there are persons here who need us to lift them up in prayer. And then outside of this community, there are people in our families. And then outside of our families, there are people in the world that need us to have faith and in our prayers carry them into the presence of Christ so that they can be healed, so that they can not be paralyzed anymore. And another teaching would be that great effort is required. Great effort is required to carry this man because you think about the crowd and, and uh, what's also called the press in some translations. Think about all those things that crowd out our mind and crowd out our lives. All those things that get in the way of us going into the presence of Jesus so that we can find healing and we need to be bold enough Bold enough to climb, to take our friends up there and to drop them through the roof, to dig through a roof which requires so much labor. So we hear a teaching of, of boldness and energy and perseverance and not giving up simply because Jesus is busy or Father is busy or so and so is busy, but actually pressing through to get our needed desires met, to get our needs met to get healing, to find Christ, to enter into his presence. Then we get the teaching that obviously sins and sickness are connected. Let's not, let's not get too religious about this. And let's say, clarify that yes, in general all sickness is caused by sin, is caused by a fallen condition. Then in specific, some of our ailments are caused by our sins. Some of them. But some people just grow older. And as they grow older, they begin to ache. And so some things are caused by sin and some things are not caused by sin. Our Lord does not say to everyone that he heals that it's caused by sin. He does not go to everyone and say that it's a demon causing it. Because he has spiritual discernment, he goes to these individuals, he sees clearly, and for this particular man, it is his sin that causes paralysis. And this shouldn't cause us to wrestle in our faith. This should cause us in our prayers to say, O oh Lord, if my ailment is because of my sins, I accept it and heal me and help me repent. Help me be forgiven so that I can be healed. But we hear here that sickness is definitely tied to sin. So when the sin is forgiven, what happens? This man was brought to this place in a stretcher, in a bed. And many of us in our spiritual lives can be carried about because we don't carry ourselves. In our spiritual lives, we're often um, people who are maybe very lazy, but also people who are paralyzed by our own sicknesses and 
we don't want to push through to the presence of Christ because we don't think we're worth it or because our legs are broken or whatever spiritual ailment we may have and manifest itself in us being stuck. What is the sign of forgiveness today? This man who is carried by others picks up his bed and walks away with his bed. And I have a mind to think that he might have taken that bed and actually nailed it to his wall when he got home as a sign and a testimony of something very real that happened to him. The moment that he was able to walk, the moment that he was able to do for himself that which could not be done before. So we see before as a sinner, he is paralyzed, he cannot walk, but after he is forgiven, his entire demeanor changes. And so we're in, the, um, we're in Lent, and as we go through Lent, we are meant to think about our own spiritual passions, our sins, our paralysis, the places where we're the most stuck. We're also called to pray more for others, and so we are called to be those people who lift others in prayer, who go boldly before the throne for others, but we're also called to come and make our own confessions, to come and ask God to forgive our sins, to become sensitive to them, because we always don't know the ramifications they have on us. We don't know what bodily ailments we may have that are related to our sins. We don't know how, uh, how many spiritual ailments and how infectious we may be. And that's why during the Great Lent, we, we bring ourselves to confession for a spiritual checkup. So that in another way, we can come before the presence of Christ, ask Him to cleanse us and heal us, so that we can be sanctified and saved. Today's Gospel has many more themes, which I won't go through. But we'll just say, with those, reiterate those, those major themes. Effort. Effort to bring others before the presence of Christ. Effort to bring ourselves before the presence of Christ. Our ailments are tied often to our sins and we need to be beseeching God to forgive us. And we need clarity. Not every sickness is caused by sin. Not every sin leads to physical sickness. Ultimately, during this period of Lent, we are here to pursue God to enter into the presence of Christ and may God bless us to do us and may God bless us to have that effort that we see expended in today's gospel in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Christ is in our midst. He is in our